Thank you very much, Dr. Simons. You've set the context, you've posed some key questions, and you've introduced an absolute essential sense of urgency to the task in front of us today. And you've asked some interesting points about archival practice and approach. I know there are others who are trying to understand these mysteries of archiving, and particularly the Royal Society panel um, looking at the state of libraries and archives. And we have with us today Dr. Patricia Demes from the University of Alberta, who is chairing the Royal Society panel. And I think we have most of your members. So thank you very much for joining us today. And while I could introduce many others in the audience, I'm going to single out one other to his embarrassment, one of the leading uh, experts in Canadian cultural policy, Dr. David Silcox, who has been a quiet hero for archives in many different ways that the profession doesn't really know about, but where he helped the profession at key points. He's also phenomenal at finding group of seven paintings hidden in attics and basements. So if you want one for your own collection, have a chat with, with David Silcox here. Anyway, um, welcome to the summit and to the Canadian Archives Broadcasting Network. Um, this is a unique experiment, I think, for us, trying to hold and launch a national discussion and dialogue without supporting the travel industry. Um, that we have now some 29 or 30 regional locations across the country who are tuned in, I hope you can see us and the technology is working, who will follow the presentations this morning and who hold their own discussion tables in the afternoon to feed in ideas, to continue the discussion and to launch it in their regions. Their tables from St. John's and Halifax to Victoria, Whitehorse, Yellowknife and many in between. And I wish this were more interactive because I would really like to look in on the group in Victoria who are up at 5.30 in the morning in their pajamas and nightgowns to watch and take part in the summit. It's a, an event that's happening in 30 locations across the country and we invite everybody right across the country to feel an essential part of this and to help build and spread the message Build the allies, I know most of them have invited the genealogical community, the local history community, they've invited the universities to attend and take part in these discussions. We're promising you a packed, intensive, and we hope productive day. There's a lot going on, there's a lot we need to do. Tom Simons has been eloquent now as he was in To Know Ourselves in providing the rationale and the ascension essential functions of archives, and it is fitting, and to provide us with a sense of continuity that we go back to his report in the 1970s to remind us of where we've been and to remind us of that very clear assertion of the power of the archival record as the foundation of Canadian studies. That confident assertion and Tom's deep commitment provided the inspiration and an opportunity for a few of us back in 1978-1980 to survey the state of Canadian archives and su to suggest a vision for the future in a report published by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council in 1980. There are very few specifics in that report. The recommendations aren't detailed, but at the heart of that is the effort to conceptualize the various large governmental and institutional archives across Canada as being an archive system. Nobody had talked about that before. There were separate independent uh, archives all doing their own thing, some doing it very well, some not so. But to re rethink the approach and become a mutually supportive, committed network, um, planning on extending archival services and to do it through collaborative action. We called on the major archives. We used to talk about total archives all media to using all formats from public and private sector to document all aspects of Canadian society. We didn't ask them to change their mandate. We asked them to rethink how they live that mandate. Because in many places, one can preserve and maintain archives in the community that created it, rather than bringing it all into four walls in the provincial or national capital. 
This was developing the idea of community-based archives, archives deeply rooted in a solid sense of community, whether local, whether it's institutional, whether it's professional, but seeing that those would have life and continuity if they had access to some of the resources and the expertise in the large total archives. The result was the Canadian Council on Archives, established in 1985, as the vehicle for our collaborative action. Marion Bia and Marcel Caille, who are both with us today, have described this in their background paper, but they also lived it, and they were the key players in forming the Canadian Council on Archives, leading to the development of national descriptive standards, the development of the provincially based archives advisor programs to help small uh, communities, municipalities, hospitals, schools, universities develop their programs, workshops on professional topics, eventually developing our common website, Archives Canada, as just a few of the achievements. In related developments over the same period of time, we saw the strengthening and building of l'Association des Archivistes du Québec, the Association of Canadian Archives. We've seen the development of their journals, Archive and Archivaria, into international quality journals that are well respected everywhere you go in the archival community worldwide. We have the graduate programs in various parts of Canada in English and French to develop masters and doctoral candidates in archival studies. On the international stage, we held the 1992 Congress in Montreal. We held the 2007 Roundtable on Archives in Quebec City. And we have seen Canadians providing key leadership in the sections and committees of the International Council on Archives. And two Canadians have served as senior vice presidents and as presidents of the International Council of Archives in the last 25 years. We now have a new open source software program called Access to Memory. It is funded by the International Council, but it's a Canadian product, it comes out of Vancouver. It's being adopted by archives around the world as the basis of their whole um, document management system within their institutions. And we have, of course, the UNESCO Universal Declaration on Archives passed in 2010, thanks in very, very large part to the initiative of l'Association des Archives du Québec on the international stage. They have made a powerful impact in that UNESCO declaration is being adopted around the world and is influencing policies at UNESCO and in national governments. Much has been done. It's been a very large agenda and it took us 30 years to achieve. The challenges of today seem no less daunting and pressing. The 1980 report did not lay out a detailed roadmap or work plan. It addressed the broad lines and themes. It talked about the attitudes and the spirit necessary. Much had to be done, had to be worked through as opportunities arose, as associations, as councils, as the committees and individuals took inspired initiatives, and yes, they accepted some serious risk. The Canadian Council on Archives itself emerged from a complex process driven and animated by vision and commitment well thought out, well argued, with a solid business plan, engaging allies and sympathizers in many other professions, but dependent on opportunity. Who is where, when, who is available, what committees, how do we advance it to the ministerial level? And it was based on intelligent compromise. In other words, it was a highly political process. The result, and you can see these tabulated in a variety of reports, but let me talk about two things that I've seen. One of my first official visits to St. John's, Newfoundland, when I was National Archivist, I asked the local groups to arrange for me to see some typical archives in St. John's. And on my schedule was lunch and an hour or two at the archives of the Sisters of the Presentation. What's the National Archivist doing going to this, this gathering and to this place? And I saw there, in the most vivid way possible, the cumulative impact of the work of the Canadian Council on Archives. Because there they are, the, the Sisters of the Presentation established 1833, key players in Catholic education in the outports in the small towns of, of Newfoundland. Catholic education ended in the 1990s. 
They began bringing their records in, establishing archives, using the workshops, using the backlog reduction grants, using um, the standards, using the advisory services, using the cooperation of the community in St. John's to create a very effective, a very efficient, a functioning, small archives presided over by a marvelous person, Sister Perpetua. Um, and similarly, yesterday, from the train coming down from Ottawa, going through Napanee, I noticed for the first time a new heritage center being built onto the courthouse and the jailhouse in Napanee. It's just 20 or 30 miles this side of Kingston. But I remember, well, first I've been invited to speak at the opening this summer, but I remember back about 1970, back when I was young and very acquisitive, I looked over their collections in the top of the courthouse and said, hmm, these are important. Public archives had already inventoried them in the 1950s. It's a good collection, but scattered everywhere in, in the attic of the courthouse. And I, of course, proposed why don't we just move all this over to Queen's University? It'd be a great idea, we'll look after them properly, et cetera, et cetera. I ran into a local wall because they felt very protective of their archives. This was their collection. It was the same attitude that colored the reactions in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick in the 1920s when the Public Archives of Canada, Arthur Doughty, attempted to collect Loyalist records and take them to Ottawa. Archives are about legal matters, but they're also about place and identity. If we work with the community, and in many senses the community can be an integral part of the context of creation and of meaning of the record. Today the challenges facing archives and the Canadian archive system are, are real, and significant, and it is time to revisit and renew our agenda. In 1997, David Cameron published a review of the follow-up to Dr. Simon's report. He complimented archivists on the amount of work we had done and suggested we were some of the few who took that report really seriously and drove the agenda. But he also noted our major failure, the lack of public awareness of the archival role. Several of us in our background papers address the challenges as we see them. I don't want to go into those in any detail about e-records, e-access, funding for content, legal issues. But a friend of mine who's a key advisor to the Government of Canada on innovation and research and development, Tom Jenkins, spoke to our staff at Library and Archives one day. And he said he sympathizes because he sees what you're doing. He said, you archivists, you're driving the bus down Highway 401 at 120 kilometers an hour. It's a well-run bus, it's a good bus, it's driving down the road, and now, with the digital revolution, you're being asked to change the engine without stopping. And if you wonder what we've been doing for the last decade, we're trying to change the engine without stopping. And it's not easy. There is, in fact, and it's complicated because one point haunts me. Yes, I'm willing to say business cases and argument and rationale, but two things from my own very direct experience. One day, going to propose to the Minister of Canadian Heritage a program for digitization of Canadian materials, particularly starting with the books. As I was going into the Minister's office and waiting a few minutes, I met the Assistant Deputy who had just been in to brief him in advance. And the assistant deputy said to me, well, you're going to talk about digitization of books. She said, but why do you want to digitize books? You have interlibrary loan, don't you? Well, yeah, we had a good interlibrary loan service. But at that, anyway, I knew that briefing was going nowhere. That was right off. And the other point is just three years ago, the parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Canadian Heritage spoke very deliberately and very clearly at a meeting of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Canadian Heritage. And speaking, I assume, on behalf of the Minister of Canadian Heritage, he clearly and very seriously advised the committee that 100% of the collections of Library and Archives Canada are digital. You made it very clear, cut off all argument, that 100% are already digital, and what was I talking about suggesting more digitization? That was clear, it was absolute. 
I don't know how we deal with. And uh, we're hearing the same story this last week about federal libraries. Don't worry, it's all been digitized. Um, not really. Uh, Canadiana.org did a study on how much is digitized of Canadian archival heritage. Maybe about 1% is digital, thanks to work and partnerships with Ancestry. With, for print heritage, the current number is about 13%, thanks to the efforts of Canadiana.org, the University of Toronto, the University of Alberta. That is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with deliberate, willful cultivation of ignorance amongst those who are making key decisions and it's going to take all of our sustained effort with those others who are concerned about the health of a knowledge economy to reverse this. I'm still enough of a bureaucrat to know that simplistic solutions, the usual send us more money, just re-establish our own entities, that's not enough, it's not sufficient, it will not carry the day. We need compelling argument and vision, a vision not for archives and archivists, but a vision for Canadian society, showing why in a digital age are the roles of appraisal and selection, of preservation and access to records, why are they still an absolute essential part of a demo democratic society? We need a solid business case. We need active support of many, from genealogists, historians, and lawyers, to information commissioners, auditors, legislators, and a lot of interested citizens. In addressing the future, I have confidence in support, and I think the existence and appointment of the Royal Society panel to look into these issues, as well as the other panel by the um, Canadian Council of Academies, shows and reflects deep-seated interest and concern. I found it as well as we began to organize this with the support from Tom Simons, Larry Alford, both jumping in immediately. You just mentioned the idea, and this is what we want to do. They were there. How do they help? Our first discussions here I had with John English and Janice Stein, and our ideas were very modest. Let's just bring a few leaders together and have a discussion with Laurel um, McDonald, uh, Larry Will Lara Wilson, and Andre Garot. The associations, the council took it up. The Monk School immediately offered space. Um, we are trying a national conversation, something unique, in that we're doing this with no direct government funding. This whole thing, and you see our, our sponsors, and they're here with us, and please thank them. The U of T Libraries, Open Text Corporation, Ancestry, um, the Library and Archives of Canada provided services in kind. Um, the Association of Canadian Studies. Thank them all because these are absolutely essential contributions to making this. And the most important thing wasn't, it wasn't hard to get. The, the money I needed from open text for this transmission, I just mentioned it to them and they said, yes, we're there, how much do you need? Um, there's interest. We have allies. Don't sell ourselves short, we have allies. And as History Society, I think we'll be talking a little more about how big and how broad we should be looking, but we have allies, never doubt it. Um, and we'll get back to, we're using words like discussion, like dialogue, we have brought together a forum, this summit, but what its content is, what its direction are now up to you. There is no secret agenda, there is no report already written that we're trying to sell to anybody, it's up to you. And I guess this summit is basically a call to the archival system and to all the others who are concerned about the state of archives in the knowledge economy, take hold of the future. Make it what you want it to be. What's for collective action? What do we do together with allies? What do we do with our associations and council? What do we do as inst institutions and profession? And what do we do as individuals to make a difference? How do we advance this? And that's what I think we're really here and all about. And I'm just going to end off here with a quote from someone who I really wish were here, who is here, I think, intellectually and spiritually, but an indomitable fellow, Terry Cook. And Terry wrote me yesterday, this is about starting a process 
interesting enough people, deeply enough, to care, to round out these issues, address what has been overlooked, and build this process as a community vision that is achievable over a generation. The process will be long and painful, but necessary if a strong enough consensus is to be built to sustain it over time. This isn't a simple agenda. There's no magic bullet with no problems will not be solved overnight. But we need to start now building the agenda. And it drives me because a year or two ago, I spoke to the Ontario Genealogical Society, phenomenally supportive, and they all said, how do we help? What's the agenda? What do we get behind? What do we push? What are we trying to achieve? Didn't have an agenda. What is the agenda? What is it we're trying to do other than restore and reinstate, and that's not good enough? Well, let's work together to develop that today and then over the next several months as we go through various studies and reports and dialogue and online discussion. So with that, I'm now going to call upon the leadership of the Canadian archival community. Uh, 